Hi, I'm Brian with HVAC School and HVACRschool.com. This video today is actually about Refrigerant Glide, and it came from somebody who watched one of the videos, a video that I did for the Dan Foss Refrigerant Slider app, and he said that he thought I should do a video describing the midpoint or the average point as in addition to do and bubble points, and I thought it was a good idea, so I'm making this video today. Thank you for the request that you had. All right, so we're going to be talking about Refrigerant Glide. We're just going to write glide here. And glide means that the temperature of boiling and condensing changes. All right, so what occurs in a refrigerant that's a blend, a blended refrigerant, so not a single refrigerant. Um, we, we're used to dealing with R22 back in the day, and it was only a single component refrigerant. And then we moved into R410A, which is what we call a near azeotropic refrigerant. Near azeotropic means that there's very little change in the vapor and liquid properties between the two refrigerants that are in the mix, which means that we don't see temperature glide, which temperature glide is you know, it, for all intents and purposes, for most technicians, why we care about temperature glide is that you have to use a different temperature for your subcooling and a different temperature for your superheat. At least that's the way that we've traditionally thought about it. But it actually goes a little deeper than that. And that's what we're going to discuss today. So this is what most technicians know. They know that for subcooling, we use bubble point. And for superheat, we use dew point. And the way you remember that is that, this is how I remember it, is that when we think of subcool, we know subcooling is a subcooled liquid. And so for a liquid, uh, bubbles can appear in liquid, liquid. And this is just completely just a way to remember it. But you, you, you don't see bubbles in a vapor, right? You see bubbles in a liquid. So subcooling is where we use bubble point, superheat is dew point. Where do you see dew? Do you see dew in a liquid? No, you see dew in a vapor. You see dew in the air. Dew comes out of the air and onto the, onto the grass or whatever. And so superheat is dew point. But we, you know we do more things with refrigerant and with readings than just superheat and subcool. And this is where it gets a little bit confusing. Because if you imagine an evaporator coil and you've got an expansion valve here and that expansion valve is feeding refrigerant into the bottom of the evaporator coil and the refrigerant travels through, we would generally assign a temperature to this based on the saturation temperature. So we would say at a, at a given pressure that it has a given temperature. So let's use the refrigerant slider app here. And we'll take a, a traditional refrigerant like R22. And we're going to go with a, you know, a typical pressure that we would see, which would be 75, we'll say. So that's a 44.2 degree evaporator temperature. So we would say 44.2 at 75 PSI. Okay. So we would say that's, that's the temperature at which the refrigerant's boiling as it goes through that evaporator. So we would call that the boiling temperature or the evaporator temperature. That's a common term that we would use. Well, with a refrigerant like um, the refrigerant that I'm going to talk about today, just because I happen to have a tank of it here, R422D, You'll notice that it's got both bubble and dew point, and when I switch in between them, it's 45.5 degrees Fahrenheit at dew, which is what we use for superheat, which means that's the temperature it's going to be at the end of the evaporator coil. We'll say right here, because here it would generally be superheated in the suction line, but we'll say towards the end of the evaporator coil, it's going to be 45.5 degrees. But at the beginning of the evaporator coil, when it's still in the bubble range, where we have um, liquid refrigerant of the, of the end, because again, you have two different types of refrigerants and they're affecting each other. And so you have this one type of refrigerant that boils at a different temperature than the other. It's going to start boiling at 39.3 degrees. Again, this is, R, this is R422D at 75 PSI. So whereas at 70 feet, 75 PSI R22, would just be at 44.2. R422D is going to start at 39.3, and it's going to go up to, I'm going to move it over to do, it's going to go up to 45.5 degrees. So we have a range. This range 
is what we call glide. So we have a glide of six degrees, you're just slightly over six degrees, right? So that's our, that's our differential. Now, when we're calculating superheat, we know that we use um, the dew. So this temperature here is what we use to calculate superheat. So if our line section line temperature is 55.5 degrees, we would say that we have 10 degrees of superheat. And that is correct, right? But when we calculate things like design temperature difference, so say if I was wanting to calculate, all right, what exactly should this pressure be based on the indoor temperature? We talk about this on the five pillars. We talk about this in checking a charge without gauges. There's a lot of cases where we want to anticipate what the pressure will be in the system to, for diagnostic purposes. Well, what temperature is it in the evaporator coil? Is it 39.3 or is it 45.5? Well, it's both, right? And so what do we do in order to calculate this design temperature difference? Or what, what, what do we actually say our boiling temperature is? And this is where we come up with an average temperature, an average evaporator temperature, or a average saturation temperature, or another uh, term they'll use is midpoint. And so what we do is we just take these two points, and I'm just going to do rough math here. And so we're going to say that it's 6.2 degrees of glide divided by 2 equals 3.1 degrees. So we take 39.3, we add 3.1 degrees, or we subtract 3.1 degrees from 45.1, and we come up with 42.4. And that 42.4 is now our average evaporator temperature. 42.4 degrees. And the same thing is true of your condenser. So you can do the exact same mathematics uh, with your condensing. Now, is this, a, is this technically a correct number? Well, no, it's a rough number. And it's going to be better when you're calculating your actual evaporator temperature than using either one of these. Is it still exactly correct? Not necessarily, because you have different percentages of each refrigerant, potentially. So it really depends on your refrigerant so if you wanted to be more accurate, you could use different percentages for different refrigerants. Um, but if you want to get a rough idea, a lot of people will use this midpoint or this average. So then the question is, if you have refrigerant in its static state where it's just sitting still, what will it be? Will it be at dew point? Will it be at bubble point? Or will it be at this median point or middle point or average between the two? And the answer is, and we're going to prove this, the answer is that it will be at the bubble point. So I've got this connected to a set of Testo 550s. I've got a tank of Honeywell Gentron 422D. You can see the ambient temperature of this tank is 70.3 degrees, which matches up very closely with a connection to the high side, which is, you know, Testo is automatically looking for the bubble point because it's looking to calculate subcool. And if I go over here and I add and I punch in this pressure, 134 psi on the Danfoss Fergent Slider app, you'll see that it matches right up, 70.5. So within you know a couple tenths of a degree. Now if I change it over to do, you'll see that it's significantly higher, 75.8. So it's clearly not dew point. This tank is clearly not at dew point in its static state, it's at bubble point, and it is not at the average temperature. And so it's at the higher pressure range at that at the given temperature. So at the temperature of 70.3, it's at the higher range. If I were to go into the refrigerant slider app and dictate the temperature of 70.3, you can see that's a lower pressure if we were calculating using dew instead of bubble. So, answer is, in its static state, the tank is going to be at the bubble point. So just as an example, on the condenser side with 422D, if our pressure was 200 PSI, that means that it would start off with dew at 100.4 degrees Fahrenheit. So if it's coming in, First it would de superheat, so that's gonna take a little bit, but once it starts condensing, we're gonna say that it starts at 100.4 degrees, and then as it goes through before it starts subcooling, so we'll save this last pass for subcooling, but in this range right here, we're gonna change it over to bubble, so 
9. So down in here. So the range starts at 100.4 degrees at condensing and goes down to 95.9 degrees at condensing. So there you have it. That is the glide in action. And then if we're actually looking at the temperature, if we want to say what is the temperature of this condenser coil, we would have to take an average of these two. But for calculating subcool, we would use the lower number, which is the bubble. Hopefully that's helpful. Brian Orr with HVAC School and HVACRSchool.com. Thanks for watching.